China disrupted the insider view. I feel very questioned. Um, it's a great, always a great opportunity to talk about China. And uh, I know this, uh, the Milk and Net, the Institute this year has a number of events, a number of uh, seminars on China. So this is only the first uh, bite of the apple. Um, so ask your most provocative questions. Um, we're going to have uh, about 45 minutes to, uh, first of all, hear from the panel. And the panel is, uh, introduces uh, is a distinguished and, uh, I would say, experienced and highly credible uh, panel on uh, the topic of China's economy and its investment opportunities. Uh, and then we want to spend the last 15 minutes talking to you, uh, hearing your questions and, uh, and your comments as well. So uh, uh, with no further ado, my name is Jonathan Wetzel. I'm a partner with McKinsey & Company. I've been based in Shanghai for the last 25 years, uh, and I have been with McKinsey for the last 35 years. Um, I am uh, with me, very happy to have old friends, Jing Ulrich, who is, uh, I think Jing uh, goes without saying, everybody knows Jing, <laughs> sort of a leading strategist and equities investor for, for many, many years. Um, Rob Petty, uh, a, as he would say, a self-described credit guy and uh, with uh, deep knowledge in the, uh, in the banking markets. And, uh, and then uh, Godwin Ga, a, uh, Godwin Ga, excuse me, a, a deep, deeply knowledgeable investor, uh, particularly of, of uh, funds from around the region. And then finally, uh, last but by no means least, we'll just call him Young. Uh, Yang is a, a master at the private equity game in China, leader of the largest private equity growth fund. So you see we have, we have, we have analysts, but we also have investors here. So I think we should feel free to you know, ask those, those specific investment questions as well. That said, let me, let me kick it off then uh, by, by taking the big view. And so the topic is China disrupted, Rob. So, you know, is China disrupted? You know, and if so, where? <laughs> You know, there's unquestionably been a lot of Western press and real disruption across the five major, major markets in China. So just my perception, if you look over the past three years and think about Western headlines, from the property market, to the stock market, to the credit markets, to the commodities markets and the currency markets, each one of those sometime in the past three years has been headline news and market disruptions and nervousness and frankly misperception of the reality of what's going on. Interestingly, if we step back and think about each of those, real disruptions, real uncertainties, real impact on world markets, but in every case, a actual response by the regulators, response by the Chinese government, response by the investment community, so that there's been stability. And actually, if you look at it in a 30-year path, I would argue it's actually extraordinary how each of those markets has developed. To just pick one, credit, perhaps less understood and known sort of in the Western markets, $30 trillion of credit. Five years ago, there was essentially no material bond market. A $9 trillion <laughs> bond market five years later. So the scale and change of evolution of these markets, the regulators aren't getting it all right. There are real disruptions coming about from implementation and learning how to implement that. But I think if you step back and look at the longer term path of some of the evolution towards fundamentally capitalist economic markets, those five major markets, they've been big strides over the time that we've been investing for 15 years in China. Jing, is that what you see? <laughs> well, you know, we talk about disruption. I think China is really on the forefront of disruption in so many different areas. But if we take a step back just to look at the macroeconomy, um, so far this year, the economy seems to be firing on all cylinders. And this is a big contrast compared to a year ago in 2016, markets had a very rocky start. But if you look at the reported numbers so far year to date, GDP growth 6.9%. Uh, we have had very rapid growth in credit. Uh, the housing market is on fire. If you look at the major cities, prices have appreciated in a very major way. We're talking about 20%, 30% price increases year over year. Um, in addition to that, even the traditional industries, uh, from steel making to aluminum smelting to uh, cement production, these traditional industries in the heart of China have actually experienced a recovery as well. On top of that, e-commerce continues to grow at 35%. Retail sales growth is 10%. So if you look at everything on the surface, 
everything seems to be very good. However, the concern is this rapid growth that we're seeing today may be coming at the expense of the delaying of reforms. So a lot of reforms should be taking place in the financial industry, among the state-owned enterprises, but these reforms have been pushed on the back burner. So that's one concern. Now, if we talk about disruption, Jonathan, one area where China is really disrupting the world is financial services and fintech. Uh, Chinese individuals now today have altogether some 23 trillion US dollars in bank savings. So just to put this in context, China's GDP is $11 trillion. So over 200% of GDP equivalent is actually parked in bank savings. <clears throat> this is the biggest pool of savings anywhere in the world. I think the second largest pool of savings in Japan is about $10 trillion. So there's so much money sloshing around the system, no wonder you have asset bubbles here and there, especially in the property market. Now Chinese individuals are using technology to manage their money. For example, Alibaba launched this um, money market fund. It is now the biggest money market fund in the world. It's 150 billion US dollars. Basically, it allows individuals in China to park the money they're now using in their e-commerce account. Basically, the funds are pulled and it's managed like a money market fund. The returns actually are very high. Um, this year, so far, I think the seven-day yield is 3.9% uh, on an annualized basis, which is very high in this environment. So Chinese individuals are looking for ways to find better returns for their money. Now, we look at the housing market, it's about 13% of GDP on paper. But actually, the housing market accounts for a much larger share of GDP because if you take into account the related industries from commodities to construction materials to home appliances, it could account for some 20% of GDP. And that market has been revived in a very major way, which has contributed to the rap rapid GDP growth so far this year. Now, it's very interesting. Um, in China, you have these uh, policies the government regularly introduced to control the overheating housing market. This year, they said uh, one policy which really caught my eye is quite interesting. You know, in China, when you have, if you're a first time home buyer, you have preferential policies in terms of lower down payment ratios and lower interest rates on your mortgages. So in China, Chinese people are very creative. They said, okay, I already own a home between me and my spouse, but we get a divorce. So then we can go on and buy another home and qualify as a first time home buyer. And interestingly enough, just late last month, the government said, no, if you get divorced, that's fine, but you cannot purchase a home as your first property unless you wait a year. So in the past, people would get divorced, they go on to buy their home, and then they get remarried and live happily thereafter. But now they can't have to wait for a year. So the government wants to prove it's a real divorce. So it's very interesting. These are very creative, I would say, disruptive policies, right? To try and regulate a traditional market, which is a housing market. Finally, I think we just have to look at uh, the issue of debt. I think a lot of my colleagues on the panel have a lot to say about the debt issue. If you look at debt to GDP today, it's around 260%. But how come China hasn't had a major issue in the debt market? We haven't had a catastrophe. We haven't had a lot of defaults. One of the reasons is that we have to keep in mind, in China, unlike any other big markets in the world, the debtors and the creditors are owned by one entity, which is the People's Republic. So when it comes to a crisis situation, which we haven't come to yet, there could be some creative transactions between left pocket and right pocket. Hopefully, these type of moral hazard problems won't occur, but this is very different. I just want to mention to everyone, the debt problem in China, I think, is manageable, particularly because the economy is recovering. The local um, governments, which rely 30% of their financing from housing sales and from land sales are actually having some recovery because of the booming housing market. So I think the debt problem is an issue, but it is not going to cause a bankruptcy in the Chinese financial system, at least not for now. Thank you, Jing. That, that was, I think, the big picture. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we got it. So what, what I heard from Rob was 
uh, yes, China's disrupted and dis uh, you haven't seen anything yet. It's still going. And what I heard from you, Jing, was that it has been disrupted, but in some ways, perhaps it may be not disrupted enough that some of these, mm. these reforms issues are not yet being addressed because of the growth itself is so attractive. And so it's just, a, you know, the tide is so high, everybody can go swimming. So, um, what, good, what do you see in the, in, the, in, the, in the companies and the funds you see? Well, I, I think China is very simple to understand, right? A lot, I think it's the Western economists sometimes, a lot of times get it wrong because they, they got to understand China. China takes everything disrupted in China. They take a very long view. So, it, so the, the vision of disruption or, or the determination of disruption is very different in China's language, per se. Everything is a long view. They, have, they believe they have one contract only. Their contract is to make sure they manage growth in a very stable way so that they, they minimize social disruption. Right? The, the last thing they want is social disruption. So if you understand that main policy, you understand what they're doing. One of the questions I think uh, the group posed was about the um, impossible trinity. China, if you look at what China does, they don't believe they have to manage the impossible trinity. They want a fixed currency. They want, a cur they want an exchange rate they can control. They want sovereign monetary policy. And if that means they have, to, they have to impose capital controls, they will, because everything is a long view. So when they, their feeling of imposing a capital control is a short-term measure, measure, and they feel if they always have that hammer in their hand, then they can actually cause a lot of speculators who want to short the currency a lot of very painful means, because they always can last much longer than you. But right? that's their philosophy. And you look at that, that's how they manage the country. When they put the capital in, capital controls in place, for example, how it affects the real estate sector, it's so simple. The first, you know, you know when there's a lot of pressure on shorting the currency, when the currency was depreciating too rapidly, you know they were coming with capital controls. And when they come in with capital controls, it's effectively like a lake with a big snow runoff. That has nowhere to go. It's going to flood. And when the liquidity in the whole lake that has no runoff flood, you're going to be flooded with liquidity. That money has nowhere to go. It's in the savings, absolutely. But the way Chinese saves is not in the bank in cash. It's not under the pillowcase. They want to save in bricks and mortars. Right? Historically, you look at all the Asian cities where the Chinese families dominate, whether it's Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, China, Hong Kong, all of that, the, the wealthy families always store their value in real estate. Right? The wealthy families have two, three, five, tw 10, 20 apartment units. That's how they do it. The other day, I was just in, um, I was just in Luoyang, which is a third tier city. And, and a little street vendor uh, doing these uh, Chinese sex, it's like a, it's like a flatbread, flatbread pizza. And I said, it's so good, you should be opening more of these stores and franchise. And then he said, thank you for your compliment. I've actually opened eight of these pockets then already, and that allowed me to buy five apartment units so, so that my kids can have apartment units. That's how they save. Right? The younger Chinese couples, uh, if you talk to the families, there's a term called naked marriage. They say, so if, if you have a daughter and your daughter is marrying a guy, doesn't have a flat under his name, when they get married, that's a naked marriage. It's an embarrassment for the family, for the girl letting the girl marry into, with a guy who doesn't have, a, have real estate, right? It's stability. That's how, so the Chinese government understand that. So when they put the capital control in place, the money is flooded in China, nowhere to go. Automatically, we all know Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, the three tier one cities, property prices will shoot up because all the liquidity floods to these cities because those are the three cities with the most liquidity in terms of property prices. That's how they see it. And that's also why you see the leverage in the property sector, especially residential, being so low. It's 30, 35%. And Jing is absolutely right. Yes, from a Western economist's point of view, the, the debt is a problem, but it's left pocket to right pocket. And, and if you look at the last time we had somewhat of a debt crisis, the government just set up these AMC, right? The asset management company take the bad debt away from the good banks, warehouse it, it's all timing, right? China, everything is a long view. They warehouse it for a few years, the problem pass, wrong asset management, sin that, all of those get listed, and everyone in this room bought the securities. Like, like it's, um, I mean, they just turned the bad stuff into good stuff, and then a few years later, everyone bought. So, that's China. So we got, yes, disrupted, maybe not disrupted off, not disrupted. <laughs> that, that, uh, the disruption it's disrupted, is <laughs> but in the view, they'll fix it when it comes. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Young, what about you? 
Yeah, is there yeah. a disruption going on? Do you see? Let, let me also comment on the marriage <laughs> and divorce. There was <laughs> there was a movie made on this, a fake divorce. But at the end of the day, the fake divorce became a real divorce, and the wife was extremely furious and complained all the way to the central government. So that was a very interesting movie. If you can catch it, that's a nice one. Since we are in LA, we talk about movies. <laughs> Uh, we, we have been investing in China for the last 17 years, only in private Chinese company. I would like to touch more into a macro level on the ground, private investment in China. Uh, if I were to, to sum up the last 17 years of experience, maybe I could give you a few points. The first point is private investment certainly generate a much higher return in China. But of course, there's a higher risk as well. The risk is illiquidity. And you, you, it's not easy for you to get in, it's not easy for you to get out. So the key point here is you have to do a very good due diligence before you put in your money. That's the first point. The second point is uh, about the private businesses in China, mainly driven by the entrepreneur, the founders. If you were to remove the founder, the Chinese business has no value at all because the founder is the main person taking in the sales, control all the resources. My point is the, the investment, private investment in China should be minority, not a buyout, not a majority. If you, if you kick out the founders, the business really worth nothing. So uh, you have to choose and understand the founder well, before, again, you put in the money. The third point is probably about disruption in China. We, we all understand the technology disruption, uh, all kinds of Uber, online, offline. But the real disruption to us uh, for the last five years is actually anti-corruption. Anti-corruption drive came from the top. And it actually affected the way we eat the way we drink, the way we do our dinners in China, the way we do our lunches in China is totally different. And it has less motivation for the entrepreneur to build golf course, to build uh, restaurants or hospital or, 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 or hotels or whatever. So it keeps the private business in a better shape. In fact, we, we are all in to support the central government on uh, even stronger push for anti-corruption uh, campaign. The previous government did that, but I think it's not lasting enough and not hard enough. So it's good that we see the current Chinese government put on a harder measure. And if the anti-corruption campaign could continue for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I think it, private investment in China will be fantastic. And all of you should jump into private investment in China if <laughs> <laughs> this campaign can be successful. So we are all in to support the central government on supporting this anti-corruption anti measure. The fourth point maybe would be on cross-border M&A. <laughs> cross-border M&A. In general, if you look at the last few years, it's mainly state-owned company moving out of China or some MNC coming into China for M&A. What we're trying to do is to actually encourage more capital to support the Chinese company, private companies, to go out of China and to have, have a cross-border M&A with companies, good companies and good technologies in Europe, in US, and vice versa. Uh, currently, we, we, we launched a China-Korean fund. We're trying to invest in Korea, Korea and try to take the Korean products to China. And we have another China-Russian fund. Russia may be sensitive, but China-Russia is a, is a way to go as well. Uh, we try to encourage more cross-border acquisition between these two countries. So this is what we are trying to create certain disruptor into private companies in China. So just to sum up, I think private, private uh, investment is the best. It gives you the best return, but of course, be aware of the illiquidity. The second point is, the entrepreneur is the key driver of the business. Go for minority, not a control deal. We are not 
trying to control the business in China, but rather we work with the management. <coughs> the third point would be uh, anti-corruption. We support the move, and if this campaign can be successful, it's going to be fantastic for the private investment in China. The fourth point, cross-border M&A for private Chinese companies. And I, I hope to trigger some questions from these four points. And uh, well, I'm pretty sure we'll get a few here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, I, what I can take away from this, first of all, is I think that ca you can, we can all agree on one thing, that capitalism is disrupting China. Yes. So China today versus 30 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years ago, I mean, it's just much more of a market-driven kind of place. And there are these private entrepreneurs and the, the, the founders and we have the, the deeper credit markets and we have the, we have the Luoyang uh, f you know, uh, flatbread pizza makers and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and we, have the, we have the pillars of industry themselves becoming private companies. And, uh, but, but I have a macro question for you, for Jing. It's, it's one of the things that was mentioned in the write-up there, that last year private investment you know, really flatlined. <laughs> it, just, it just fell like a, a stone. Um, any, any hint? Is that, was that, is, that, is that a canary in the coal mine? Or should we be worried about that, you know, if we're saying that well, capitalism is a good thing? Yeah, there's a lot of um, discussion around this topic, Jonathan. Um, the economy in China has been growing around 6.5 to 7 percent. Um, the outsiders are saying, look, that growth is all coming from government-directed investments in infrastructure, highways, airports, etc. Private investments have been subdued. And that is correct to a degree, because in the past couple of years, private investments have been on the sidelines. Many of the entrepreneurs have seen overcapacity in industry. They're holding back their investments until such a time when investments would have better returns. Actually, in the first quarter of this year, we're beginning to see private investments recovering, which is quite good, because otherwise, if the economy were just riding on a wave of public sector directed investments, eventually the momentum will slow down. So in the first quarter of this year, we're seeing private investments recovering. I think that indicates private investors, entrepreneurs, are beginning to regain confidence in the economy. Uh, one of the other issues we need to look at is between the old economy and the new economy. I think the new economy sectors are getting a lot of private sector investments. Look at the top companies in the sector. They're all private, from Tencent to Alibaba uh, to some of the uh, other e-commerce players, JD, and also companies involved in travel, entertainment. None of them are state-owned. I mean, look at Tencent, this amazing company, which is listed in Hong Kong. I think right now it's about 14% of the Hang Seng Index. Market cap, I work for JP Morgan. The House of Morgan has been standing for how many years? Over 100 years. Our market cap is $320 billion. Tencent is right there uh, with us in terms <laughs> of uh, market capitalization. Remarkable, over $300 billion. Um, and it's amazing. Uh, Tencent is a real disruptor, right, when it comes to online payment, games. Everyone in China, I think everyone here on this panel, has a WeChat account. You can use your phone to pay for everything, literally, in China. You no longer carry cash or wallet. Right? That's all Tencent, right? So I think the private sector investments have been very buoyant. Now, the trick is to get private investment to go into some of the more traditional manufacturing industries. I think this may be happening because we talk about modern manufacturing. We don't talk about old smokestack industries anymore. So in modern manufacturing, we still need a lot of investments, not just from government support, supported public sector investments, but private sector investments need to be unleashed into the modern new manufacturing industry. So that, that may be where that, that renewed investment is coming from. Is That's saying. what it is. In the first three, uh, three months of this mm. year, we've definitely seen a pickup in private sector investments, not just in services, mm. technology, but also in new manufacturing industries. Okay, great. Well, let me now turn this to the, to the, the investor side of the conversation. It's like our esteemed panelists here. How do, uh, so how do you play this? You know, how, do you, how, do you, how do you invest in this uh, disruption? <laughs> so, so many interesting points to pull out here, but our strategy is very straightforward and very downside credit mindset. We've actually do two things. We have two standalone direct lending businesses. That's what we do. We like to lend at the top of the cap structure. We have big teams onshore. One we've done in partnership with Huarong, 
the largest asset management company. So we learned in 2010 and partnered with them, and that's grown to be a $4 billion balance sheet of just doing senior secured lending. The credit markets are actually really interesting. That was so successful that we went and replicated that and built our own 100% control platform. And again, anchored in property, anchored in the fact that the rule of law is better than you think in China, not because Westerners came in and said it, because they needed to fix up their banking system, as Goodwin highlighted the last time they cleaned up the balance sheet. So you can now go and force on a property quite effectively, quite quickly in China, which again is a perception in the West that probably is not the reality, specifically in private companies. I think the private company point is thing. We only lend to private businesses. We only lend at the top of the cap structure. And not only are we sort of doing interesting deals, but we actually build an enterprise. So again, if you say, actually we've built a foreign controlled direct lending, non-bank financial institution in China, just like NMBFC or some of these other entities across US and Europe, actually can do it in the private sector. You actually have control. So some of those control issues that we all worry about as investors, it's been interesting. Top of the cap structure and you know make ROEs that are double digit. And that's kind of an interesting way to play financial institutions. And the last point I would make is the Chinese government wants this. The state-owned banking system, they want that to shrink as they want some of their other state-owned enterprises to shrink. They want other more sophisticated pools of asset management for all the savings and liquidity points, and there are real opportunities for that. So it's, you're actually in line with what the government is trying to do, and so we think financial services is a really interesting play if you can get comfortable with sort of the downside piece. Makes sense. Absolutely. It's all about being in line with the Chinese government, right? The Chinese government as a sector, they want to promote the service sector at the expense of the fixed asset investment, right? So they, they want less investment into manufacturing, so it's less polluting, more jobs for people to go away from the factories in the southern China and go back to their homes where there are going to be jobs waiting for them in the service sector. If you look at that theme, right, then you look at, uh, and Jing is absolutely right, the companies like uh, JD, Tencent, Alibaba, these are all world-class companies with technology that is actually, it's a reverse learning because in China you have over 800 million smartphone carrying users using it daily. It's, it's going to be the first cashless society in the world. Yeah. Uh, the way, I mean, I, I barely carry any women bee anymore. From five years ago, we have stacks of women bee, right? It's, it's remarkable. And it's a reverse innovation now, actually, from application of a lot of this technology in China. But how that's happening, you, you're seeing these uh, private companies becoming really, really uh, world class in terms of how they operate, the management team. And so how they translate to real estate, for example, in our sector is very simple. Um, just like in U.S., there's a lot of growth going in these secondary cities that have, that's offering lifestyle, like Denver, Portland, Nashville, Austin, because the millennial generation choose lifestyle first before they choose where the job is. China is starting to see the same thing. A lot of these are tech-centric, uh, innovative-centric companies where they're growing. So they're now growing in cities that's offering good lifestyle. That's why Hangzhou, where Alibaba is based, is growing rapidly. So you can find these cities where that's going to grow because it doesn't have the traditional industry of the pollution, but it has a lifestyle that people want to move to. And then secondly, it's just how the companies, the new age companies are consuming real estate as a product is also different. How, how in U.S. you're seeing your definition of space is much, more, much different these days, what you want, how you collaborate. In China, that's starting to happen. And because e-commerce is so disruptive for the shopping center sector, for example, so one of our strategy has been buying up old empty shopping center that's overbuilt in this uh, city center in Shanghai and Beijing. People always say that's a white elephant. One of the projects, we took, we took a 800,000 square foot empty shopping center in the middle of Beijing. Everyone says it's a white elephant. We bought it and we said it's perfect to be creative office. Warehouse style floor plate, high ceiling. So we are renting space not on the floor plate. We're renting space as a volume. Three, you have to take a three floor chunk, but it's like a little townhouse. So 13, so we chopped up this space into a 13, three dimensional block of space, right? And people ate it up. So we actually got premium rent versus even the high rise rent. So, so if you can be creative, you're gonna find opportunities as certain industries are getting disrupted. And the retail industry is absolutely getting disrupted. Another thing that the government is pushing for, they want experiential, uh, because experiential real estate, experiential um, shopping experience, for example, will create a lot of service level jobs. And, and that's what they want. And we have a, a, a shopping center that's built like an Italian village with gondolas. It's a, I don't know how to describe it. It's a combination of Florence, Milan, and, 
It has St. Marco Square, it has the canal, it has... Vegas. It's, it's, it's like Disneyland, but it's an outlet mall. And you'll be surprised, this outlet mall is generating, it's 55,000 square meter mall, it's generating a thousand US dollars square foot of sales, despite offline retail going down, get, getting the lunch eaten by um, online retail, because it's experiential. People go there to take wedding pictures, they, they push the strollers there on the weekend, so the kids, so now we learn, we have to figure out how to keep people there longer to, to do more shopping. So we're creating kids zone where your kids are being taken care of for five hours. We're building hotels so they can stay overnight and spend more and more money. It's experiential retail, right? It's a, it's a barbell effect. So th there's a lot of disruption going on in China because of the, um, how people use a smartphone. But because of that, it's also creating a lot of on the ground opportunities. Awesome. Love, 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 love the uh, the Vegas like sort of concept. <laughs> it's basically a combination of Rome, Florence, and Milan in one. I, I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. Um, what about um, disrupting outside of China? Also, I mean, this, it does. You know, how to play this? If you were looking at, you know, does it, is it only? Can you only play China disruption from within China, or can we also find ways to play it from out? You know, uh, proxies outside of China, growth opportunities, or the funds that you were mentioning, Young, around. Uh, and, uh, Russia or Korea? Or Ying, what do you uh, Also, well, China is uh, disrupting the international markets, I think, in several major ways. One, China is now the largest exporter of capital in the world. Uh, we all used to know China as a big importer of capital. Of course, for many years, many multinational companies have invested hundreds of billions of dollars in China. But starting three years ago, the outbound capital, ODI, Overseas Direct Investment, has now surpassed FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, into China. So China is a net exporter of capital. So if you look at um, the acquisitions China has been making overseas, the first wave was mainly commodities. You know, After the financial crisis, China needed iron or coking coal. Uh, so they invested a lot in Australia, Africa, and, and Latin America. But in the most recent wave of investments China has done overseas, it really involved a lot of service industries, entertainment, uh, technology, uh, IT, uh, also real estate. As uh, Goodman has mentioned earlier, the Chinese have a love affair with the brick and mortar, right? So they not only buy homes and properties in their home cities, but they've gone farther afield, much farther afield in London, New York, Vancouver, and here in Hollywood. Um, so China has been acquiring assets overseas, and this is a function of the tremendous amount of liquidity in China that has been accumulated um, over the last many years. So many Western companies now are looking at China as a source of capital. So look at the Hollywood studios. Quite a few of them have been acquired by the Chinese. Um, look at Chinese entrepreneurs buying technology, uh, buying know-how in the West. So in a way, we should look at China in a, in, through a different lens. It is no longer a poor country. It is already a middle-income country. And in keeping with China's rising stature in the global economy, it is increasingly going to make waves in a global investment community across all industries because China will use its financial firepower to acquire assets overseas. One of the companies you own, or one of your own companies perhaps, could be uh, targets for Chinese acquisitions in the future years. We all have to be very prepared for it. Which can be a good or a not so good thing. Both options. So the uh, but I, I certainly see a lot of Chinese investment outside of China in uh, my own business of uh, city building. So whether it's in Africa or the Middle East or India, South Asia, uh, just uh, China's the new global infrastructure standard. And so That's it true to be too. Quite yes. A, Quite a, quite a theme here. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, yeah. uh, China, Russia, <laughs> what do you see? Yeah, it, it is the point of you creating disruptive outside of China. Mm -hmm. So we created a China-Russian fund. Uh, we work with the Russian sovereign wealth fund to create, a, to create a joint investment vehicle to invest in both countries. Uh, we are looking at technologies, we are looking at food, we are looking at certain uh, aviation uh, technologies from Russia, and we would like to take them to China and use that to kind of improve the quality of uh, technologies level in China and vice versa. Maybe 
the what we talk about Tencent, the WeChat, we could try to take it into uh, Russia as well. And we created a China-Korean fund as well. We invest in Korean companies, very good, very innovative Korean companies, good technologies, good uh, cultural contents, and try to take them to China. Uh, the point is, when we take them to China, we take them into a private investment, private companies. That would actually cut down the interference of states. Uh, we could actually implement those technology easily via those chi Chinese uh, private companies. And I'm just curious, do you find it easier to take companies uh, from Russia into China or from China into Russia? We, we <laughs> definitely it's not easy. When mm. anything in and out of China is not easy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need to go through the proper procedure. And we have been doing this for 17 years. We know how to do it. And mm. that's why I mentioned about the anti-corruption part. That would make a lot of jobs easier. And uh, we, we foresee a much better prospect in the next five years and the next 10 years. Uh, we could get approval a lot easier, but the, the only control from the Chinese government recently is actually really the capital inflow and outflow by the central bank. But we could wait because our private investment could wait. You don't have to do it tomorrow if you don't like to do it. You could wait for next month, two months later. It's okay. Can I pick up on one thing, Jonathan? Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier the construction of cities. China is the new infrastructure standard. You know, I want to bring up the topic of the one belt, one road. I'm yes. not sure whether people have heard about that. So one belt, one road. Uh, in about a week's time in Beijing, Chinese President Xi Jinping will be hosting 28 heads of state in Beijing at this major belt and road summit. So if you haven't heard about one belt, one road, we better understand what it is. So first of all, it's a little bit of a misnomer. The belt is a road, the road is a sea. So what am I saying? One belt is the ancient Silk Road that goes from Northern China to uh, Central Asia, Russia, all the way to Europe and down to uh, the Middle East. And the one road basically is a maritime Silk Road from southwest, Southeast China to Southeast Asia to the Indian subcontinent and again to the Middle East and then somehow converges with the belt. So this is Xi Jinping's major visionary, uh, uh, I guess, initiative um, announced a couple of years ago, covering 65 countries, two thirds of the world population. So essentially, this is going to be a major economic block covering the entire Eurasian continent and some Africa as well, right? So there's a lot of um, uh, investments from China that's going into the Belt and Road countries. And in addition, a lot of the Belt and Road countries, Russia included, uh, Kazakhstan and yeah, all the Central the Asian countries are very uh, uh, energy and resource rich. And of course, China is trying to tap into the resources, not just from sea lanes, in importing oil from uh, West Africa and the Middle East, but also importing gas and energy from uh, uh, pipelines through uh, Russia and other countries. So, so this is essentially China's major supply chain, right? Uh, China will end up exporting a lot of the excess raw materials from cement to steel to these countries, helping these countries construct infrastructure, but also exporting engineering know-how. And in return, China will be receiving a lot of natural resources from these countries. And the goals President Xi Jinping announced are actually, no one can say they're not good. They're very lofty goals, basically, to improve regional trade and to lift poverty, well, li lift people out of poverty, right? So this is a major initiative, I think, that will be unveiled in um, this up in, upcoming uh, conference in Beijing. But also, uh, this is ob obviously a multi-decade um, project probably trillions and trillions of dollars of investments will go into the Belt and Road program. Yeah, 60 percent of the world's population, I think. You know, I, I was going to touch on a similar follow-up talk, and I do think it's <clears throat> worth sort of highlighting that policy because I go to Dubai and they will talk about the One Belt, One Road and how the sovereign wealth funds there are partnering with China. So you yeah. don't just see it in China, you actually see it. And the reason I highlight that example is it's another example, follow what the policy and the government direction is you can make money if you listen and you think intermediate term. And so to give it more specifics, I think it's really worth remembering it's not just the software and consumer 
technology business that have taken off in the private sector, but it's also the hardware. And what do I mean? Foxconn. If we think we're going to beat Foxconn as we build you know, smart manufacturing here, think again, that is a disruptive private company that is really a hardware company, but it integrates so software and technology. And another place that I think is really a real disruptor, and the one I really want to tie to the One Belt, One Road, is the train system. Goodwin has better data than I do, but it is absolutely extraordinary for anyone to get on a train in China and have a different lifestyle experience. You can get on a train and be in LA from Center City, sorry, from be in San Francisco from LA in just under two hours, right? Center city to center city. You brought the country so close. They go at 350, 300 kilometers, 350 kilometers an hour across the nation. So when you talk about, Goodwin talks about lifestyle in Hangzhou, you can get there, right? You know, getting from Beijing, down, it, it's fundamentally changed how we think about it. And it really is another example of infrastructure. We built our business in Chongqing. Why? It's the beginning of the one so, you know, it's the beginning of the Silk Road, arguably. And the infrastructure there, seven subway lines in five years. Yeah. Really? They aren't all completed, but the infrastructure scale is extraordinary. And getting on those systems and seeing that and feeling that, how it changes people's lifestyle, it's not just a technology change, but I think there's a hardware component to it, too. That's massive. Absolutely. Hong, Hong Kong, Beijing link opening in the next four months, eight hours from Hong Kong, basically Shenzhen, high speed train to Beijing. But I'll give you one data. China believes, it's, it's all about them thinking about the long view. They really believe in infrastructure, how infrastructure actually developed the commerce of China. In 1990, India is 10% larger than uh, China in GDP. I think 326 billion versus 288 billion in 1990. In 1990, India had 62,000 kilometers of train tracks. In 1990, China had 57,000 kilometers of train tracks. China today is 123,000 kilometers. India went from 62,000 to 66,000. Right, so today's GDP is 2.2 trillion versus 11 trillion. China is 5x of India, right? So that's what they see, that's what they believe. I mean, some of the smaller cities I, I recently visited, I was blown away by how quickly. I mean, Hangzhou from Shanghai, Hangzhou is now a weekend town yeah. for people in Hangzhou, for people in, living in Shanghai. It's, it used to be a three hours drive. It's now 45 minutes by high speed train. Um, and obviously, China, when they think of the long view, Jing is absolutely right. They set up the AIB, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, one belt, one road. That's the way for them to tackle all the excess deal and excess demand production and figure out how to generate economic growth in these uh, old economy cities that are dying right now in China and, and taking up the capacity on the one belt, one road and make a lot of friends of the way, along the way, right? So there's a whole Asia pivot going on. And in terms of investing idea, with all these high-speed train tracks, China now has the largest high-speed train network in the world, with the rest of the world combined, yep. right? China alone, the rest, rest of Europe, rest of the world combined is still less kilometers than China on high-speed train. That means direct domestic tourism on all these domestic tourist sites, it's, it's, just, it's almost like you go to any of these big sites, it's like a flood, it's like a river of people, despite <laughs> these sites being so large, and uh, outbound tourism. Right, when people travel, Chinese per spending per day outbound tourists is the highest of any nation. And on top of that, 133 million outbound tourists last year. Despite everyone thinking the Chinese economy is slower, these are disposable income. These are income, uh, if people don't feel good about the economy, they wouldn't be traveling and spending money, right? 133 million, and if you want to pick which city to invest in, find the ones that are embracing Chinese overseas students. Because when the parents send the kids to go study overseas, they almost always buy a flat nearby. And then after they buy a flat, they'll go buy a building, right? That's how they think. And so sure, you I'm find schools sure that have capacity that one. for, for <laughs> Chinese <laughs> students overseas, <laughs> that city is going to experience some growth. Yeah. Um, and that's also why you're yeah. seeing more and more investment shifting to Australia. Very simple reason. One, mm. U.S. lifestyle, quality of air, quality of water, but the same time zone and half the distance and a cheaper currency, right? So a lot of these telltale signs is very, very simple to figure out. And, and I think other than exporter of capital, the exporter of consumerism from the tourism, tourist side. And, and we know in the U.S., um, our millennial generation are much happier um, buying experience versus just buying material goods. And that's happening in China, too, for the outbound tourists. 
I think we've, uh, we can keep going back and forth like this <laughs> for the rest of this, but uh, it's about time to give everybody else a chance to, uh, to, to pitch in with uh, skeptical, cynical questions. And uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's start from the back there, right there on the left. Thanks. Um, Goodwin, this is kind of a question to you. You know, you all invested all over the place in China in terms of the different industries. You know, one of the areas that I haven't heard much on logistics, and so I was curious, maybe you can comment a little bit about that. We see a lot of that in Australia in terms of logistics, and so kind of where is the where is it in China right now? You're absolutely right. I, I, the reason e-commerce, you look at Alibaba's year-on-year -year number, 48% year-on-year growth, the latest second quarter numbers, despite the size is remarkable. Because of the early adoption of the smartphones and shopping on the mobile devices, which has leapfrogged the computer screen and leapfrogged a lot of the uh, more traditional retail channels in US, for example. So that's actually causing a massive um, demand for logistics space. So we, are, we have a strategy specifically for that. And um, it's just, despite the volume that of money pouring into the logistics sector, it's still probably the third inning of the build out because all the railroads being built, all the new highways being built, that's where logistics need to locate, right? And because of how China is developing and how mature, how much mature, more mature its e-commerce sector is, you, it's, uh, we're starting to see where you have these very, very large regional distribution center that's gigantic, right? Manned by robots. But then they're breaking it up into much smaller in town or close to town on the fringe um, smaller distribution center because your logistics space is essentially taking away uh, expensive shop retail space where you store the goods into a cheaper regional network uh, to be delivered by drones, to be delivered by bicycles, local di uh, distribution companies. So you're seeing a bit of a different model. I would, be, I, I would not be surprised if that model ended up will be reverse learning. The U.S. guys will figure out how that's being done because China, everyone is shooting for same day delivery now. They're hoping that you go to a shop, you see the product you like after you try it on, you scan the QR code, that item will be delivered to you in the afternoon. That's what they're solving for, and China will probably get there before US, just because this, all this stuff is new being built. Okay. There was another question there. Yeah. On the skeptical side, um, the uh, credit has been decelerating a bit after a, a very fast growth last year. One alternative story to tell about what happened last year is that there was uh, another opening of the credit gushes um, that, that was directed via state investment and that now that's starting to be clamped down again. Um, we're seeing the shadow banking come under a lot of pressure in the last six weeks. Um, uh, CBRC with the new boss is starting to put pressure on. Could all of this, I mean, typically this tends to lead economic slowdowns um, and there's, there's quite a tight link there. Um, are you concerned that now the, the mere deceleration of credit, even if there isn't a full tightening, could be a problem? And then on top of that, that the shadow banking clampdown could take things even further? Maybe I'll take a first crack sure. at it and you can... Yes, please. <laughs> so there is a credit issue at 260% of GDP in China. It's not out of bounds, but it's absolutely something that they're worried about and that people, I think, acknowledge, the government included. So let's remember the state bank statistics, publicly available statistics, special mention loans and non-performing loans, 5.8% of total banking system, right? That's over a trillion and a half dollars. You can argue that that's too low and we can debate non-performing loans, but you know, let's call it two trillion to round up and be conservative. You know, in a banking system of its scale, that's a soluble problem. It's not a, but it is a problem. And what are they doing? You actually look at what the Chinese government is been doing, they actually have been solving some of the right-hand and left-hand issues. I'll use Sino Steel as a good example, right? So people criticized in the Wall Street Journal last year that, oh, they did debt for equity swaps on the banking system starting last year. Well, actually, that's a good thing, isn't it? You're taking the loans to the steel industry that probably were not going to perform and not going to work, and you move them over to SASIC. So yes, you did go left-hand, right-hand, but it got equitized. It's off the banking system, and you're actually consolidating and shutting down in a steel. It's going to take time. It's not perfect. They are shutting manufacturing businesses in coal, in steel, in shipbuilding. Pick your favorite you know, heavy industry. But they're going to kick the can down the road, and they have done some of that, i.e. term out. You could argue that the whole development of the bond market is a terming out, which actually isn't a bad thing. 
Five years ago, you'd look at a company's balance sheet and you'd say, how do they do this one-year rolling bank loans? Well, today you can actually look at the larger companies and they actually have five-year bonds out there. So it is a problem. They are facing it. The, the asset management companies are big and doing this. There's, a, there's going to be an NPL business, but we don't think, and this is all we do, right? We didn't buy into the first distress crisis. We've been there for 15 years. There are things we do and don't do, but I do think the system has the capital and the experience to sort of kick the can down the road, but they can't get too far to line. The last thing I'll talk about is shadow banking. Shadow banking is not all bad. We do it in the Western world. We built non-bank lending and we think it's a good thing in the Western world where you get dedicated pools of capital that are targeting specific opportunities. The single biggest shadow banks in China, I think, are the four asset management companies. If you go look at Huarong, the largest, and look at their 11 subsidiaries, they're doing consumer finance. They own securities lending business, 11 different subsidiaries that do the good parts of dedicated financial, you know, in the consumer space. So I don't think all shadow banking is bad. Wealth management products can be problematic, and there's clamping down appropriately on where you're disintermediating and you're doing some you know, excessive lending. So there are going to be pockets of problems. But, but I do think the regulators are on it, and I do think they have the capital. You're going to see a disruption. You're going to see a shock around it. Generally, I think it's opportunities, but we, we got to be watching it quarterly. I think it's probably a good thing. Now the recent Chinese leadership has been putting a lot of emphasis on risk control in the financial industry. They have mentioned the control of uh, uh, shadow banking also certain wealth management products distrib distributed by the banks. Um, I think if you think about it, right, GDP growth has been in the region of 6 to 7 percent real growth. But credit growth has been much faster, probably 12 to 14 percent. So what this tells us, you, you need to pour more money, more liquidity into the economy to get that extra uh, GDP, percentage of GDP growth. Uh, this is not sustainable. So I think the leadership over the long run wants to bring credit growth in line with GDP growth so that you don't have diminishing rate of returns, right? So this is one thing. But secondly, uh, in view of the recent developments, the leadership uh, had a meeting maybe 10 days ago emphasizing the importance of the financial industry, saying the sound, uh, a sound economy basically has to be based on a sound financial system, which is absolutely right. But we need to keep in mind the risk is unevenly distributed across the banking sector. The large state-owned banks in China have very strong deposit franchises. They are largely funded by retail deposits, which are very sticky. So they are relatively safer compared to some of the smaller banks, which tend to rely a bit more on wholesale funding. Uh, also, if you look at the balance sheet growth, the smaller banks and regional banks have grown their balance sheets much more rapidly, much more aggressively over the last five to ten years. So in a way, the larger banks are, are safer uh, because of their more secure sources of funding, but also because they've, bro they've been growing their balance sheets in a much more prudent way. Just, uh, I don't think, isn't it fair to say that the traded net asset values of uh, Chinese banks typically do already reflect a significant discount? Yes, uh, they're trading the, at 80.8 um, uh, So people price kind of book. already, already yeah. priced this in. The Chinese banks, by the way, are very large in size. They're the largest banks in the world. I mean, just JP Morgan is the largest financial institution by market capitalization in the world. But our asset base, $2.6 trillion, actually smaller than some of the Chinese banks' balance sheets, right? ICBC is probably $3.2 trillion. Uh, the construction bank in China balance sheet is probably close to $3 trillion. Um, also, the Chinese banks are very profitable. In terms of net profits, um, ICBC uh, is making close to $1 billion US dollars per week in net profit. Uh, their first quarter earnings just came out, as you can see, 75 billion uh, RMB. So they're on track to make over 45 billion US dollars in net profit. And as Willie Sutton uh, said, that's yeah, where the money is. Very, very profitable. <laughs> Great. Are there um, any more questions? No. Right, right in the front here. Uh, thank you. I would be interested to know the panel's assumption on China's uh, long term. Uh, trend equilibrium growth rate for the next five to ten years, and if you believe that's uh, under six five per, six point five percent, which is a growth target at the moment, what will be the drivers uh, uh, that will sustain this above trend growth for a prolonged period of time? Thank you. 
I don't think we'll grow 6.5% into eternity. <laughs> Growth rates will naturally slow down because of the large base effect. Also, China does face demographic challenges. Um, and also the leadership is now focusing not so much on the quantity or the pace of growth. They're beginning to focus a lot more on the quality of growth and where the growth is coming from. So I think we need to stop being fixated on the actual GDP growth number. We need to see where the growth is coming from. Most importantly, as the economy transitions away from manufacturing towards services, from fixed income to private consumption, you will probably see growth rates slow. However, if we grow at 4%, 5% on the $11 trillion economy, that's still pretty good, right? The US economy is $17 trillion, but in the first quarter, as you know, we grew by 0.7%. So we're trying to get to 3%, as I hear from the president, but it's very difficult to achieve, right, when your economy is, is at a, such a large size. So I would say the long-term sustainable growth rate for the Chinese economy will come down, but don't be alarmed. The most important thing to watch is where consumption is going and where services are going, because these are the propellers for China's future growth. Maybe I, I, I add in one point. Whether the economy is growing at 6.3 or 6.2 or 6 percent, our investment in chicken farm, the business as per normal, no change to our private investment, either in chicken farm or in a milk cow. It's the same. We, we were not alarmed at all for that 0.1 or 0.2 percent difference. We have one time for one last quick question right there. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about restrictions on, on capital leaving the country. We saw the Fosan transaction uh, fall apart. Today, there's rumors of the Genworth transaction falling apart, yet you have folks like HNA who, um, at least so far, have been able to, to deploy capital outside. W what's really going on there, and how should U.S. companies be thinking about Chinese as acquirers giving the policy? So you have to differentiate between different types of investments. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you have speculative investments on the part of Chinese companies or individuals who want to invest in football clubs or real estate assets just to get money out. Then there are other types of investments which entail investments in poor areas uh, to acquire technology, know-how, to expand uh, the company's businesses overseas. So the first type of speculative investment I think will be heavily discouraged. But the second type of investments, investing in core area technology uh, to try and globalize the company's uh, uh, business model, these types of investment will still be allowed to go ahead. The Chinese leadership has said, you know, we opened the windows already to the outside world. We're not going to shut the windows. But in the most recent quarters, they have introduced tighter control on capital outflows. They think these controls are necessary because it would trigger too much capital flying, uh, leaving the country, putting pressure on the RMB. Now that the RMB has stabilized in the recent uh, quarters, as you've seen so far this year, the RMB has appreciated 1% against the US dollar. Um, and also the reserves drawdown has also stabilized. I think they will begin to have a more um, liberal view towards capital, uh, fl uh, capital flows in the future quarters. But the long-term trend is firm. Chinese national champions will need to become global champions. Sometimes you cannot just simply rely on organic growth. You need to make acquisitions overseas. So I think in keeping with China's rising stature internationally, these outbound investments in the future years will continue to increase, although some speculative type of investments may be discouraged. But the long-term trend is firmly in place. May I just echo that? That's broadly very articulate representation of what we see as well. And I think the same holds true in terms of inbound mindset. If you're coming in to do speculative investment, that's where you've seen the clampdown. But if you're in line with onshore policy, same thing holds true. So both inbound and outbound, that same mindset of... Great. With that, I want to thank the panel for an insightful and fun panel in the audience. Thanks.